good morning everyone uh, it is it is my proud privilege and honor to host uh, one of my uh, distinguished friend from the fraternity uh, sri rodney d rider he has a distinguished uh, legal career uh, uh, and uh, i'll uh, start with the, a, a brief introduction of his he has very you know long prolific experience i cannot read everything but i'll uh, be brief in uh, introducing his credentials and uh, also give you a glimpse of uh, what he is going to cover in today's topic i hope uh, by the by the time i give his introduction uh, uh, the audience will get increased uh, and, 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 and 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 in fact uh, uh, this exercise is actually meant for the participants and attendees and i am i'm sure all of you would get enriched by this the the cyber law discourse which uh, sri rodney d rider brings in with us today uh, to formally introduce uh, rodney d rider is a lawyer with over two decades of experience in technology data privacy intellectual property and new media laws he is the founding partner of scribboard a full service commercial law firm with cutting edge specialization in technology new media and intellectual property laws he is the author of uh, guide to cyber laws uh, the information technology act 2000 uh, e commerce uh, data protection and the internet and the first section wise analysis of the information technology act 2000 we can see understand uh, the the amount of scholarship he has bring in this uh, this field of uh, legal uh, jurisprudence and this is an emerging area i hope uh, uh, most of the cyber law uh, you know aware people would and, and in fact uh, you know not to tell you the importance of uh, cyber law and security in today's time when we are uh, you know dealing in highly digitalized world in fact we are conducting our you know live session through this mode only and you know so pertinence and importance of uh, cyber law can very well be understood he is presently advisor to the ministry of communications and information technology government of india on the implementation of information technology act 2000 he counsels a wide range of clients from startups to the fortune 100 and represents them in litigation regarding technology law data security compliance with law enforcement and intellectual property strategy he is on the board and advisor to le all many leading companies he is regularly interviewed and widely quoted by indian and international media on technology intellectual property and new media laws he has a very long profile and it will be a uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, i i can go on and on but uh, i think this brief introduction would do um uh, in today's uh, uh, uh topic of uh, technology law uh, security uh, legal compliance uh, uh sri rider is going to talk and cover three broad areas of uh, cyber law and cyber security one is the internet crime uh, basically uh, dealing with the cyber crime law and policy so he'll be including uh, uh information technology act 2000 structuring a policy and in fact the you know in india is gearing up towards uh, you know finding uh, an institutionalizing a national cyber security strategy perhaps that will be a, a, a talk on on, the, on this uh, um, aspect and also he will uh, uh, touch upon current laws in india with regard to cyber crime second aspect of uh, his talk would be on data privacy and information security and we all know that you know india in india we have got this personal data protection bill which has been introduced which is now you know also uh, we are incorporating lessons learned from different jurisdictions specifically european union gdpr uh, regulations which has come come up and this is very current arena data privacy is uh, one of the important aspect and the third aspect is the digital brand management and security where uh, he'll talk about corporate theft, theft identity and unauthorized use and also touch upon online dispute resolution digital brand management and certain case studies 
So uh, Sri Rider, it is uh, my pleasure and um, intellectual pleasure to host you today uh, amongst the audience. And I hope you are listening to me. Uh, I like to hand over the, the floor to you for further discussion. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind words. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Uh, my greetings to uh, uh, Professor Sharma, uh, to our host, uh, Vatsala ma'am, and to all our participants uh, here with us uh, today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what I'll try to do is to share my screen in a bit. Uh, the idea is to um, get uh, us to just uh, uh, have a few talking points here, like uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, the idea of uh, talking to all of you today, and I am uh, aware that uh, many of you uh, have a deep interest in internet law. And as a practitioner, uh, I want to share with you um, roughly three broad areas, which are uh, important areas of our law firm practice. These may not be uh, the, the most trending areas for all times to come, but they are very important trends today. Uh, we have other issues on the sidelines and uh, in our question and answer session at the end, uh, I would be delighted to take any questions that uh, any of you might have. My thanks once again to the university, to Professor Amit Singh for his kind words and for all of you for being here uh, with me today. So uh, as Professor Singh said, there are broadly three parts to my presentation. One is uh, the IT Act. The IT Act and internet law, um, what it means to us and compliance with the IT Act. Compliance with the IT Act is an important practice area for us uh, in our law firm. Another important area is data privacy. And I think that is going to be the uh, practice area, uh, at least you know, for the next uh, uh, five years to a decade. The third part is digital brand management. It's domain names and trademarks on the internet, but this has a profound implication on corporate identity and security. So we are doing a lot of work there. These uh, three areas account for uh, over 80% of our technology law work and revenue. So for young lawyers and for young lawyers to be, it's important that I talk about quite simply what is uh, hot in technology law. So as we move forward, uh, a summary for you. I've titled this The Medium, The Code, and The Law. And the first bullet point is titled The Rise and Fall of Cyberspace. And what do I mean by the rise and fall of cyberspace? Because um, I am old enough to remember a time when many thought that the internet could not be regulated that there would be a new law for the internet. Uh, Post and Johnson, David Post and David Johnson of the Stanford Law School wrote this very interesting article titled Law and Borders, the Rise of Law in Cyberspace. And they said that the internet in its present form cannot be governed. And we would need a new internet law. And that's their thesis. It's a very interesting paper, but a New York University professor, Yokai Benkler, said that the internet is a medium and every medium has three layers, the physical, the digital, and 
content. So you regulate one of these layers and you regulate the internet. Uh, in one of my books, I had a chapter titled Regulating Indian Cyberspace. And what do I mean by Indian Cyberspace? Section 75 of the Indian Information Technology Act says that any offense committed by a computer, a computer system or a network in India or committed on is tribal under Indian law. That means we are clearly saying that Indian law will extend into cyberspace if there is an Indian system, an Indian computer under attack. Further, uh, colleagues like John Goldsmith and Timothy Wu wrote an interesting book, uh, which was titled, Who Controls the Internet? The Illusions of a Borderless World. And it says that law and technology will work so closely together that we can switch on and off the internet whenever we want to. We can track people to the last detail and no longer will we have a situation where there is total anonymity on the internet. And that has come true. We have now people talking about what is known as the surveillance economy, where every time you go onto the internet, you are being watched and followed. And that's an interesting part of what we have to deal with as internet lawyers going forward. So why do I title this the rise and fall of cyberspace? Because in the beginning, people celebrated. They said, oh, the internet is a place where anybody can do whatever they please. After all, cyberspace was named cyberspace after Gibson's Neuromancer, where you had this utopian or rather dystopian place where everyone was free to do what they wanted. That is clearly not the case. Law and technology are working together to regulate what we call cyberspace or the medium. That's point one. When we look at our Information Technology Act and what it gives to us, in a nutshell, the Information Technology Act of 2000 amended uh, has in a nutshell for itself, the use of the internet um, uh, of the Information Technology Act in a phrase is functional equivalence. That means everything done digitally or online is equivalent to something done offline. So my text message or my email communication is equally valid as much as a paper record. An electronic record is as admissible in an Indian court, and in fact, in many courts and almost throughout the world, as a physical or paper copy. Therefore, for lawyers, it's become important to understand the role of the medium. When you have a crime, when you have an act, is the role of the medium incidental? That means, I use the internet, but I could have used any other um, medium. So for example, intimidation, criminal intimidation or blackmail, I could have done it anyway. In Treasure Island, you have the pirate known as Black Dog uh, blackmailing his former captain, Billy Bones, by uh, giving him a black spot or you have three orange pips uh, in the Sherlock Holmes story. You have movies which, where, where you have a character writing on glass, I know what you did last summer. Or you can have someone send you a text message, a post on Facebook, anything could be intimidation. The medium, my point is, is incidental. Then you have content, harmful content, obscene, sensitive material, uh, uh, hatred of sorts, which is amplified by platforms because of the reach of say, a social media platform or a communications mode, but is not an internet crime in itself. Yes, the internet is very important in amplifying the message. And then you have what I term pure internet crimes, 
which relate to the integrity of a computer system or a network, unauthorized access, tampering with source code, so on and so on, uh, so forth. So it's uh, this will give you the impact of the IT uh, Act in a nutshell. Then I hinted some time ago about Section 75 and the fact that any offense involving a computer, a computer system or a network in India would be tried under Indian law. But how do you get a hacker in a hostile jurisdiction to appear in an Indian court? And the Americans did it in Adobe Systems versus Dmitry Skylarov. Dmitry Skylarov was a Russian hacker who hacked into and was able to um, decrypt the Adobe Acrobat Reader. And not only did he do that, he put it up on the internet saying that uh, I hacked uh, Adobe's ebook reader. Here's how you can do it. Adobe was upset with him. They wanted to catch him. They said, this is an offense. We want to get this hacker. The problem is that Dmitry Skylarov is a uh, Russian uh, based in Russia. And the fact that uh, Dmitry Skylarov uh, uh, cannot be uh, extradited under the law was a problem. So what do uh, our friends do? They invite Dmitry Skylarov uh, to America, to Las Vegas, send him his air ticket. And the minute he disembarks or the minute he crosses immigration, they arrest him. So uh, one interesting way of enforcement, and you can read up how that case ended. In terms of evidence, the presumption as to the admissibility of an electronic record and section 65B as amended by the IT Act is also a connector which connects digital law um, and everything that is electronic or an electronic record to the uh, very robust, very ancient, but robust uh, Evidence Act of 1872. The, uh, the thing that we must remember here is the totality of the collection of evidence in Dharamvir versus CBI, this is captured in a sentence beautifully, which says that once a blank hard disk is written upon, the entire disk is an electronic record. And that's important for us in terms of uh, being members of, if we are members of the prosecution, to understand the collection of digital evidence. Then quickly, offenses. And we've seen that uh, uh, the IT Act uh, looks at certain offenses seriously. These are offenses after the amendment. We know that section 66A, a very controversial, which uh, made the transmission of offensive messages through communication illegal and punishable. That was struck down by the Honorable Supreme Court and Shreya Singhal because the section was too vague, too broad, and also uh, according to the Honorable Apex Court being misused. Uh, you have other sections that look at identity theft, uh, cheating by personation, violation of privacy, uh, cyber terrorism, uh, obscenity, so on and so forth. But where we in our corporate practice get uh, uh, affected or where our clients have to be extremely careful is section 43A, which puts the onus, the duty on an organization to maintain reasonable security practices and procedures. That means that all times I have to uh, make sure that my uh, office, the data under my control is uh, subject to and maintained by and is protected by reasonable security practices and procedures. That is very different from um, general um, uh, duties and general liability. Uh, for example, if I you know, am outside the office or outside my home, if I walk down the street and I just put a bolt on my door and someone comes in and burgles, um, the police 
had no business to ask me whether my house was secured or not or what kind of lock did i use whether the house was bolted or not theft is theft but here in case of a computer breach the organization is also liable if they have not maintained reasonable security practices and this is a huge compliance area for our clients and therefore one of our important practice areas is the cyber audit where we as lawyers work along with folks in technology human resources and we look at the security of the organization in terms of guarding against possible vulnerabilities against uh, the proper maintenance of security standards and procedures and we have depending on the size the nature of the organization prepared a cyber audit checklist to ensure that we are compliant with the highest standard understanding uh where critical information is secured who has access understanding what the threat landscape is about this is a lot like a mini kingdom preparing for war you need to know what your crucial assets are uh, in terms of information assets uh, you need to know who has access you need to have the right protocols and safety Uh, and security standards in place and that uh, my friends is an important uh, uh, part of our practice and is a continual uh, 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 part of what we do to service our clients and we've done it uh, and this is an important practice area i wanted to leave you with this important point not only is section 43a a serious section for companies but uh, in case you have uh, a breach or uh, a lapse uh, section 85 says that every person who at the time the contravention was committed was in charge of and was responsible for the conduct of the business of the company will also be liable so it's a very serious section for uh, uh, you know anyone who's in charge of security members of the it department uh people who have to sign off in case of a public listed companies uh it's an important provision which all of us must be aware of uh further before going forward into other areas i wanted to share an interesting case study it's a very short case and i encourage all of you all to look it up um at one time it's a very simple and uh 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 you know it looks pretty straight forward this involved an era about 15 odd years ago when there was a dispute between reliance and tata tele services over the fact that tata tele service employees had encouraged reliance customers to come to uh tata outlets and um the tata engineers had enabled uh the uh, reliance customers to receive the signals on their phone or the uh, the tata signals on their phone so this was a controversial matter it was about competitiveness between two companies it it was uh, quite the headlines in those days but from a legal perspective we are not bothered about all of that we are bothered about uh the interesting issues that has have been discussed in this very brief but interesting judgment first um did cellular phones or do cellular phones fall under the indian information technology act and in this case one of the basic questions was is a cellular phone a computer and the answer is yes if you read the definition of a computer as per the relevant section of uh, section 2 of the indian information technology act you will see that the definition of a computer is so broad that can can cover anything from literally uh, your uh, calculator or less to any complicated device so um one 
a good and rather great thing which we have as a legacy of our colonial drafting is to draft sections which are broad and uh, encompassing of so many things. So do cell phones fall under the IT Act? Is there a cell phone law or a mobile law? We've got the IT Act. So clearly uh, the decision says that yes, a cellular phone as per the IT Act is a computer. Now, did the engineers hack into a cellular phone? The answer is quite ambiguous as to whether you can hack into a phone or a device when the owner of the device is giving you permission to do so. So any deed done with the permission of the owner of the device cannot be hacking. But was it tampering with source code? And the answer is yes, because the electronic serial number and the system identification code, which come under the definition of a computer source code. So a very interesting case, uh, no longer relevant in any other thing, except that it breaks down for the student of internet law. This breaks down um, some interesting questions is very readable and um, I encourage uh, you to uh, go to the source to uh, and um, we've had some wonderful precedents in India but this looks at things in a very simple robust and basic way. Uh, moving on social media and you have many many um, uh, interesting issues especially intermediary liability, information security risk, and you have much which is going on on social media, including new guidelines, uh, whatnot. Uh, we have been proud uh, in our association in the last 10 years to be representing Facebook in India and to be representing many brands in their interaction on social media in their handling of legal issues. And sometimes, uh, despite the best precautions, people can end up um, doing something which is uh, which is maybe not uh, with uh, uh, ill meaning or with anything else, but can lead to tremendous embarrassment due to the nature of the internet. So there are we have developed checklists. We've developed ways in which. Uh, our clients and corporations can look at social media and look at the potential threats from information security risk to uh, scams online through fake uh, uh, Facebook or pages or Twitter accounts to security breaches. And we've got um, uh, quite a few important things, but ba basically when you are looking at a social media policy for an organization, it should look at addressing information management, the collection, use, access, and dissemination of information, and look at the guidelines under the IT Act. And with the guidelines under the IT Act, also, um, I would add, which is missing on this particular slide, is also in the future guidelines under the uh, personal data protection uh, bill or act as well when it becomes law uh, looking at the the liable uh, the the issues that are raised by the platform the liability raised by the platform terms of use restrictions relating to the platform so the uh, we as advisors to organizations have to advise them that please do not look at social media as a one block a uh, twitter is very different from facebook uh, Facebook is very different from Instagram, uh, very different from WhatsApp. So you have a particular policy crafted perhaps for each platform, each important platform that you're looking at. Again, you have multi or cross jurisdictional issues in terms of the European Union and GDPR. And then you have some uh, issues that just come up as, uh, uh, you know, without meaning to. Someone in an Asian jurisdiction put up uh, representing Unilever and their famous Axe perfumes put up what they thought was funny. Um, 
an ad uh, uh, supposed to be uh, hilarious, uh, uh, you know, on Hitler and the Axe effect, um, not knowing that the parent company Unilever uh, is based in Europe and images of Hitler, images, uh, Nazi items are considered very, very offensive to associate Hitler with Axe. Uh, would uh, in fact bring a lot of embarrassment to the parent Unilever company. Uh, so this was harmless, but it uh, went out of proportion like some uh, uh, things on social media, on Facebook and the likes sometimes uh, tend to happen. Uh, then in terms of data privacy, and that I suspect is going to be uh, a very, a prominent area of practice moving forward. Uh, for those who are looking to, to make a career in this area, um, let me give you an offhand statistic. Uh, when the data privacy directive came out in the European Union uh, in the year 95 and thereafter, from then to now, every major or almost every major technology law practice in any of the big firms uh, have been headed by data security or data privacy specialists. So that's the kind of impact of data privacy on technology law practice. So it's becoming a very, very important area of practice and is something that we, whether we are information technology lawyers or corporate lawyers, we cannot afford to ignore data privacy. So we've had some issues with the new economy. And one of the issues is the massive generation and collection of data. So security experts talk about uh, the American government and their uh, secret storage of data uh, by the American law enforcement agencies in a place called Bluffdale in Arizona, where you have exabytes of data in huge data for, uh, farms being collected and stored. These are data relating to almost every phone call, for example, made into and out of and within the United States. All is being collected. And it's not only the data of what is being spoken about, but it is more importantly metadata that we forget. For example, uh, on the 19th of March, uh, 2010, where was I? Maybe the 19th of March, 2010 is an important date for me, so I might not forget it. But broadly, where was I on the 19th of March, 2010? Uh, 14 at uh, 12 o'clock uh, at noon. So I might not be able to remember offhand, but that is metadata being collected by Google because I own an Android phone, collected by my telecom service provider. So you have all of these kind of uh, 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 authorized and unauthorized collection of data. That means that we are constantly under surveillance. And that's a very uh, important point for us to uh, understand and acknowledge. We are under surveillance. And when we think of surveillance, we think of maybe the good old folks in law enforcement, the Uttar Pradesh police or the Haryana police, uh, or the good folks who in the Madhya Pradesh or the UP uh, police who visited Kharak Singh and Govind Singh and the Supreme Court decisions in those regards. But here surveillance is becoming extremely easy. I don't have to tail somebody down the road. No constable has to follow Govind Singh to the market or Kharak Singh. Here you have as people sitting in some control room somewhere who know where I have been yesterday. They also know what time I came to my office this morning. They also know what time they will know when I leave because my cellular phone is with me. They knew what 
time I woke up in the morning and not only today, but for the last 100 days, 1000 days, 2000 days. And all of that is information that probably I will not be able to remember. So all of this collection of data and another statistic from, to share with you that from the first recorded data in human history, some clay tablets in the Indus Valley civilization or some clay tablets in Mesopotamia by the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates. From the data from that time, all the data created by the human race till the year 2013 or 2014, that much data, that sum of data is being generated every three or four months in the world today. That means there is massive data. And the data has been collected. That data might be analyzed in the years to come. So we are looking at now developing robust systems which look at how that data should be managed. And here in the Indian context, a few years ago, we had the remarkable decision in Putaswami, which related to the individual's right to control data. And the nine member bench of the Honorable Supreme Court 9-0 in favor of privacy said privacy is a fundamental right. But it's very important for us to put a framework in place. One, there has to be individual control over private data. There has to be transparency and understanding security practices. A few years ago in Europe, a young uh, uh, legal scholar called Max Schrems wrote to Facebook demanding to know what data Facebook had till then collected about him. He was expecting a few pages or so. He got a huge, a bundle of more than 200 plus pages which had every detail of every time he had ever accessed Facebook, how much time he had spent. So clearly, Many organizations, many platforms are collecting data about us, which we don't even know or don't even understand. The third point is respect for context. Organizations must collect, use and disclose information or data in a manner consistent with the context for collection. Security. Secure handling of data, especially sensitive personal data, access and accuracy, and accountability as to what is being done with that data. And presently in the IT Act, you have the reasonable data, um, the reasonable security practices and procedures and sensitive data uh, information rules, which I term the rule book for data management presently in a regime which is pre-personal uh, 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 um, data protection. So you have mandatory privacy policy, collection of information, so on and so forth. So you have these rules which relate to the disclosure of data to third parties. And also the fact that every organization must have a privacy policy, must have security practices. Uh, you have the Privacy apparatus in terms of the privacy policy, which details the collection of personal information, um, security policy, so on and so forth. The appointment of a grievance officer. You have the personal data protection bill, which I would say is the most important development. Every one of us should be uh, aware of this. And uh, this is going to be an important area of practice, like I said, which in, introduces a lot of important uh, concepts, the right to in, obtain information, the right to data portability, to have data transferred, to re restrict the disclosure, and newer rights which are derived from the European Union, the right to be forgotten, 
the right to object to data processing, the right to data portability, which I mentioned earlier. So this is going to be huge. I would encourage us to have perhaps a, a deeper insight into this in the times to come. And you have uh, offenses for data breach, for data mishandling um, uh, now in crores that we are looking at. And before we end, I'll just take another two minutes to talk about the third important area of our uh, practice, which is a huge area in itself, and which is protecting corporate reputation online in terms of fake websites, uh, so on and so forth. So we have, in effect, for domain names, the uh, uniform dispute resolution policy, the uniform domain name dispute uh, policy for all corporate commercial lawyers, extremely important, and even otherwise, for all lawyers, because for the last two decades, this has been the, uh, in my personal opinion, the, the best uh, online dispute resolution system the world has seen. The first, like I say, truly global online dispute resolution system. When you go to register a domain name, you have your uh, registration agreement, which contains the dispute resolution clause. Anyone who has a problem with that registration can invoke that clause. That means this dispute resolution is contractual and mandatory. There is direct enforcement because the domain name is locked. It's international between any two parties anywhere in the world. However, the scope is limited to cyber squatting. That means that the complainant has to prove that they have the rights that the respondent does not and is limited is limited to bad faith. There are due process safeguards in terms of neutrality, in terms of the notice to the other side, an opportunity to be heard, impartiality and independence. And these disputes are, are to be resolved ideally within a period of 45 days. So that's remarkable in terms of the speed and efficiency. And some of the cases we have done uh, for Indian oil, we, uh, our clients discovered that a gentleman named Nitin Jindal who had this lovely site which was, apart from other things, was advertising almond oil and massage oil. And our clients, Indian oil, are neither into almond oil or massage oil. And this was an unauthorized site. Again, trademark Indian oil belongs to Indian oil. Nitin Jindal does not have any rights and this is bad faith. Same for uh, MS Dhoni, whom we represented in the case of msdhoni.com. This gentleman, David Handley, among the many people who bought and sold msdhoni.com for money, again, puts it up for sale. MS Dhoni has trademark rights. Uh, David Handley does not, and this is clearly bad faith. Uh, same for Santa Fe Packers and Movers discover that there is another local brand in Delhi's Mahipalpur uh, who've registered, who've created uh, by all means a beautiful website. What was what was rather sad and somewhat funny is that the fake Santa Fe site, which you can see, is was ranked on Google higher than the original uh, Santa Fe site. Uh, again, this was a uh, interesting decision. Likewise for Havels who discover that HavelsIndia.com. And this was interesting because these good people tried to back out. They said, we are ready to transfer the domain name back to your clients. Actually, we had registered it just like that. We had never heard of Havels in our whole life. So we responded by telling the, uh, the panelists that we need a decision. And once an arbitration proceeding is commenced, we have a right to a decision. So this was a once in a lifetime precedent, I think, where one of the parties insisted on a decision because we said we cannot allow the other side to say that they had never heard of Havels when they have registered Havels India. Uh, that was a little uh, incongruous. Uh, the decision is quite interesting. Similarly, I always say that uh, uh, Trademark lawyers, unlike copyright lawyers, trademark lawyers have no sense of humor. So you have people for the ethical treatment of animals discovering that on another site, 
there are people eating tasty animals how terrible horrible but more importantly a brand violation as well uh in india you have the indrp and you have a number of cases where you have the domain name being registered and the email id being used for all kinds of mischief like in this case shlumberger limited uh registered by some mysterious manoj kumar from bulandshahar who doesn't have any address or phone number but there are engineering students all across india who are getting emails from alex.juden at schlumberger.co.in alex juden is the global hr head of schlumberger sitting in houston texas who doesn't have the remotest clue that there is someone impersonating him in india and sending out uh, these sort of uh, messages similarly for general motors there is a mysterious gentleman who is sending out these uh, things as well uh, again for crab tree so uh, i think we've come to the end i'm sorry if i've overshot time a little i tried to make a masala movie with a lot of ingredients a little extra and i uh, you know i apologize for taking the extra uh, you know time uh, now one last thing uh, i tried over the years to to have or write my own blog i've been unsuccessful but what i have done is collected and we've put up a website called metacept which has a, a technology law uh, articles we are trying to develop it it's in a very initial stage but you all are welcome to uh, you know uh, visit it to uh, to read some we try to make it topical it's very very um, you know in a very nascent stage at the moment but in uh, by your visits and maybe some of you would like to contribute we would love to accept articles uh once again my uh thanks to each and every one of you for being patient and and uh, listening throughout my special personal thanks to professor amit singh for the kind invitation um you know it's it's really an honor sir for all of your colleagues sir for professor sharma for vasla ma'am for everyone at the apj satya university thank you so much and thanks to all your wonderful students for being kind and patient thank you so much so pleasure is always ours sir uh, thanks for uh, uh, you know responding to our call positively and nothing like uh, having an intellectual discourse uh, on 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 an issue where, where you have so much expertise and uh, have developed a lot of practical uh, knowledge onto the subject uh, the floor is open for the participants to chip in um, you can raise your hand and uh, there is a question answer box where you can also write your question uh, uh, to ask from uh, our guest speaker uh, so it is open to all of you uh, if you have any questions on this very very pertinent and important topic in in era where uh, we are you know doing almost uh, everything uh, digitally so i will wait for your questions and um in fact uh, if vatsala could also you know put on uh, uh, in fact uh, if you could enable others uh, uh, to raise question in a uh, voice mode it's uh, up to you vatsala so i'll be giving them access to talk so that they can ask question instead of promoting them as a panelist so you cannot see their video then yes yes okay as is there a question for any one of you or even anranjan sir or any of the panelist uh, i mean uh, i can include myself also uh, you, you you can raise any questions or query rodney sir we tried to get as number of audiences as possible but perhaps 
uh, you know, we didn't get uh, much of the audiences. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it has been around 20 uh, in the in the attendees. There, there are questions, sir. Uh, uh, yes, uh, two questions you, you can see in the question and answer. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, one question, uh, uh, Rodney uh, uh, Divya is asking, sir, we keep getting calls from several mobile companies that you are having Airtel connection, but you make lot many calls to Jio. Why don't you change your connection? That's right. a question from Divya Misra. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think uh, Divya has also clarified that whether it is a cyber threat because they are accessing our calling data. And the answer is uh, yes. See, the very reason why privacy is so important is because uh, this is a great example, Divya, of metadata. Uh, here, the person knows that someone from an Airtel connection is calling Jio, right? The, there is no, I assume that there's not very much other information. We don't know the Jio number. We don't know anything else. But the very fact that this personal bit of information has fallen into the hands of people who allegedly want to use it for marketing is disturbing in itself. And that's um, um, uh, a matter of concern. And this is why our personal data protection bill is so important because it is not possible for each one of us as private citizens to even uh, know how much data is being collected and what is being done with that data. Uh, because we cannot stop sharing our data with our telecom service provider. Now it is incumbent on that entity not to share it further. And like I said earlier, you have respect for context because this data is shared with you in a particular uh, association, in a particular uh, relationship that that entity has with you. It's not to be used for other marketing purposes. So yes, it's a threat and it's actionable. At the moment, it may not seem to be a big threat, but in the years to come when data is analyzed, uh, and anyway, it, it uh, a threat or not, it sounds downright creepy for people to know whether I'm calling some geo numbers or I'm calling uh, Vodafone numbers or anything else. It's uh, according to me, none of anybody else's business. Uh if I take the chance of uh, um, uh, you know your uh, in inputs on national cyber security strategy, Rodney, uh, I think it is going to build upon the national cyber security policy, which was put in place in 2013. Uh, especially uh, as India has become a potential threat of uh, you know a lot of cyber cyber security issues, uh, you know emanating from the neighboring country, you know. Uh, especially China, which is, uh, you know, you know, in, in the last uh, few weeks, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, Chinese hackers uh, even getting into the, you know, uh, hacking the power system in, in Mumbai and other places. And even the government uh, sites, I think government defense site was also hacked. Uh, so, um, you know, what do you see uh, how we are going to evolve our uh, national cyber security strategy, I think, which is, which is being, uh, you know, at the moment being pondered over by, in the government circles. Right. I think, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. This is, a, an in, uh, again, another interesting uh, uh, area for us to, uh, you know, focus on because uh, the cyber security uh, policy needs to be uh, looked into needs to be formulated at several levels. Of course, there are the big, uh, uh, you know, assets which are constantly uh, under foreign uh, observation and surveillance in prominent targets. I think the government needs to uh, find ways of um, having uh, security that's uh, uh, really um, uh, at par with the kind of assets that it has. We've seen uh, the incident in Maharashtra. Uh, uh, also, there needs, apart from the policy, 
we need to do uh, certain uh, things we need to have a cyber security mindset uh, we need to understand uh, the architecture of the internet remember something as simple as a domain name wasn't built with a security uh, purpose or a security system in mind so many a times what's happening is that our our domain names which we access the internet are not uh, themselves secure or that you have um, indian domain names which are resident or resolving to servers abroad um, all of these things need to be brought under control secondly that there needs to be a, a combat readiness um, uh, for cyber threats in our armed forces and also our law enforcement uh, and i think that this needs to be distributed evenly right now um, as uh, you are aware sir we've had a tremendous success in the metro cities but the same level of success training and preparedness is not visible across the country and we need to see that the cyber uh, security and the cyber policy looks at uniformly developing our access because uh, again past attacks on the national informatics uh, center and their uh, assets have looked at the most uh, vulnerable uh, websites have looked at the most vulnerable indian uh, psus uh, and that needs to be addressed all right uh... there's a question by one of our student prakash uh, uh, is asking so what are your tips for protecting ourselves against identity identity theft i uh, see uh, uh, prakash thanks for the uh, question uh, you see uh, when you are looking at uh, identity theft first of all um, constant uh, awareness policing is one thing uh taking prompt action another um uh, and of course you know when it comes to um you know someone impersonating someone uh this is an offense and uh i think uh, law enforcement and others should be more cognizant of such uh, uh activities when it's a corporate now my views are slightly uh, uh different because right now the it act while it places the burden of maintaining security on corporates it does not penalize them for the fact that they can look the other way in case an identity theft is happening for example if there is a bank called xyzbank.com that's their official um you know uh, domain name they have an official twitter account so on and so forth but if they uh if there is an xyzbank.org which has a similar website which is trying to reach out to people and and misuse their identity then xyzbank.com it is incumbent on them to take measures it's different for an individual like yourself and me we might not have the resources but corporates do and it's incumbent and it's their duty to see that uh, their identity is secure i think that uh, there are a number of provisions both in the indian penal code and of course you have identity theft being covered in the it act as well so we have the provisions um, it's just that sometimes as soon as we become aware we should be able to complain uh, wherever the appropriate authority is or to one of these platforms in case you're being impersonated on say twitter or or facebook now both uh, and most of these uh, social media platforms are strictly against uh, such dubious activities and will disable these accounts immediately uh all right i, I think uh, we are almost on time so and uh, uh, before i ask uh, my esteemed colleague anranjan ji to uh, give a word of thanks i have uh, asked uh, in fact vasala uh, to enable video uh, uh, so uh, now you all panelists you all can uh, open your videos just for clicks you know uh, last minute clicks and uh, now uh, i would uh, request uh, my colleague anuraj ji to uh, give word of thanks 
in fact sir uh, thank you sir in fact this is a proud privilege to present my vote of thanks the lecture was really very illuminating and uh, now i see my phone uh, i in fact i am seeing it uh, it appears to be a surveillance center now i will switch off its internet so very enriching lecture sir and i i request you to keep up this association in future also thank you sir thank you for coming thank you dear colleagues for attending the lecture and last not the least all the students for participating over here thank you sir all of you are requested to open your cameras for just a minute thank you and if everybody can rename rename themselves please because most of them have joined with mr prakash choudhary's name please rename yourself thank you no wonder mr choudhary is asking about identity theft is very concerned so that is what i also observed you know oh, i asked about the so this is this is what you call uh, a practical legal advice <laughs> thank you so mr. much mr choudhary uh, you switch on your camera please mr choudhary please he has he has uh, already opened so uh, did the question come from the real mr choudhary or uh... <laughs> <laughs> no sir no sir from me uh, right right thank you and uh, hopefully sir we meet in person some day soon definitely nice, sir i uh... i look forward to sir and right. as i as i said uh, i would look forward to you know jot in certain points for mutual uh, uh, you know mou between your form and School of Legal Studies at APJ Satya University.